Well, thank you, uh, Corey and Russ, for inviting me. And uh, thanks again to Rick McDermott and Steve Hanauer for putting together such a blockbuster course. I think each year I've been at this course, the audience seems to grow, the room seemed to get bigger. So uh, again, a compliment to Rick and Steve on what they've done. As um, Corey alluded to, I'm planning to give an update on post-operative management in Crohn's. And we actually do in the last year have some new exciting data. And I'm going to integrate this into a talk and try to leave you with two practical algorithms at the end of the talk, in some ways similar, in some ways different, and quite probably what you're using in your practice is today. So looking at the medical management of post-op Crohn's, I think the main question is, when do we start treatment? Should we start post-op treatment immediately after surgery, or should we wait for some recurrence? Still, despite our early aggressive therapy, patients with Crohn's disease often require intestinal resection. In the coming year, 2016, we will still rely on symptoms to guide treatment, which this means patients who present to your offices for the first time with Crohn's or for that matter, ulcerative colitis, may have damage or disease too far gone for medications to work. And it's interesting that patients may be clinically silent up until the point of diagnosis. When we consider the natural course of post-operative Crohn's disease, and you may have seen this before, but just to recap this, imagine a patient that you see in your office. They undergo surgery with an ileocolonic resection. For that instant, the surgeon leaves the operating room and says they're cured from Crohn's. There's no active Crohn's in their bowel at the time uh, right immediately after surgery. But look what happens when you track over to the right. Within one to two weeks of surgery, in the macroscopically normal neo-terminal ileum above the ileocolonic anastomosis, there's already histologic evidence of disease. Track further to the right, and I'll give Corey the answer, and I think many of you probably got this already. Up to 70 to 90% of patients, one year after surgery, if you do a colonoscopy on that patient and look at their ileocolonic anastomosis and above, they already start to have macroscopically evident Crohn's. Track further, they start to get tissue damage. Ultimately, they have symptoms. And in the old days, prior to treatment, about half of these patients would still require another surgery at some point down the line. This paradigm probably could be used to explain many of the diseases in an immune-mediated fashion. And what I mean by that, we predictably know where Crohn's disease recurs in the bowel after resection. As such, this has led to genetic studies. We're involved in a microbiome study right now looking at some of the changes around the anastomosis. Paul Rutgers in 1990 had shown us and come up with a scoring system for post-operative Crohn's disease. And I think many of you may apply this in your practices, and it's a pretty easy scoring system, in that when you do a colonoscopy, look at the anastomosis and look at the neoterminal ileum. If it's normal, that's a zero. Less than five ulcers, one. More than five ulcers, two. More severe inflammation, three. And finally, more severe inflammation with stricture, a four. What we've done is we've somewhat applied this to clinical practice and trials to describe endoscopic and remission and endoscopic recurrence. And I should mention a caveat. This has never been validated in a certain treatment trial sense. It's been used to predict who may have recurrent disease in the future requiring surgery. So the severe disease, three or four may require surgery. Interestingly, many of the patients you send to surgery, their deepest remission and the best that they will feel is right after surgery, usually for that first couple years, despite having scores of two and three, often on endoscopy. So Paul showed us that over 70% of the patients in that initial study had scores of one, three, four, and did not have clinically active symptoms. So if you did a Crohn's disease activity score, many of these patients were in remission. So if you haven't seen these scores before, the top would be a one, bottom left a three, and the bottom right a four. And I think that we're used to seeing this in our clinical practices and now applying these scores. So how do we treat post-operative Crohn's disease, and where do we go from here? So 
prior to about five to seven years ago. When did we use 5-ASA antibiotics? Should we use steroids? Probably not. Azathioprine, 6-MP. And where do anti-TNFs and now other biologics fit into this? And how do we monitor these patients? Do they need a colonoscopy? What about calprotectin, ultrasound, CRP, and some of these? So let me start by the early treatment approach, meaning take a patient to surgery and start medicines afterwards. So this table still applies, although we published this in 2009. We compared the placebo-controlled studies with 5-ASA, budesonide, the nitro and midazole antibiotics, which are like metronidazole, azathioprine, and 6-MP. And if you were to compare across studies or within studies with placebo and active treatment, the endoscopic recurrence rates were still quite high in these studies and not significantly different than placebo. The one interesting box that stands out on this to me is the nitromidazole clinical recurrence data, 7 to 8 percent clinical recurrence on metronidazole or nidazole. So I challenge the audience, and many in this room are working on microbiome, I truly believe if we can figure out the microbiome altering agent that is well tolerated, not metronidazole, that may not only be the prevention for post-op Crohn's, but also a potential treatment. So based on those studies, at least 45% of the patients, even with azathioprine 6-MP, had a recurrence, which means that many of these patients would go on to need another surgery. So then the question is, what about post-op anti-TNF? So certainly over the past five years, there's been a lot of hype around this, but the question is, is that worth the cost? So we did the first randomized placebo-controlled study in 2009, and you've seen these data before, but it was a two-arm, double-blind, placebo-controlled study, and we did a sample size calculation. So for some of the young investigators, when we talk about this study, we took a guess, and we do this many times when we come up with sample size calculations in our studies. We knew from Paul Rutgeert's and others' data that 70 to 90 percent endoscopic recurrence at a year, so we picked 80 percent for placebo. We did not know what the endoscopic recurrence rate would be for infliximab one year later, so we guessed. And we said 20.7 percent, primarily because we wanted a small, even number to distribute. Interestingly, though, remember that number of 20 to 21 percent, because that comes back. So what we did is we randomized patients after surgery to either three-dose infliximab, then every eight weeks, or placebo three doses, and then every eight weeks. And the bottom line is that one year, 85% of patients in placebo red compared to 9% in infliximab yellow had an endoscopic recurrence, and there was a large delta. I should mention, this was a very high-risk group for recurrence. Many of these patients had surgeries before. Many of these patients had penetrating disease, were smokers, and had failed other uh, therapies in the past. But this is only one small study. Should we really initiate treatment based on one study? Or as one of my coordinators said at the time, the study is so small, you could fit all of your patients on one bus. Well, in Pittsburgh, when we think of the bus, we think of this guy. But one of my patients pointed out and sent me another bus, and he put this together, which I thought was kind of funny. Any study that can fit 24 patients on one bus should not be the pivotal be-all, end-all study. So there have been several studies since then, the four in blue on top with infliximab, six in white in bottom with adalibumab. When you look at the middle column, this is endoscopic recurrence, generally at one year, some are longer, and zero to 21 percent. So interestingly, that 21 percent number is what I, I would remember. Zero to 21 percent endoscopic recurrence at one year on either adalibumab or infliximab compared to control, which may be placebo or different treatments. So that's all well and good, but that was a small study. So now we have some data from the International PREVENT study. So the PREVENT trial looked at post-operative Crohn's disease, similar to what we did in our smaller study. However, there were some differences. One difference was that the primary endpoint looked at efficacy of infliximab or placebo at week 76 and used a composite endpoint, which I'll explain in a minute. The secondary endpoint is what we're used to in terms of endoscopic recurrence. So the clinical recurrence definition for this, and we should get used to these combined endpoints with clinical symptoms and endoscopic findings. This was a composite endpoint which included Crohn's disease activity indices scores, but with endoscopic recurrence of a score of greater than two. 
Also, if patients had any fistula or complications of fistula, that was defined as a clinical recurrence. So that was the definition for this study. The secondary endpoints you've seen before, this is the Paul Rutgers endoscopic score, zero to four. Zero and one we included as remission, two, three, and four as recurrence. So what was the bottom line from the study? Week 76 is on the left-hand side is the primary endpoint. Week 104 on the right-hand side, uh, which is one of the secondary endpoints. And what you can see from here are a couple things. Orange is infliximab, gray is placebo. And what you can see is overall the endoscopic recurrence rate at week 76 was quite low. 12.9% in infliximab, 20% in placebo. But this was not statistically different, so the patients didn't meet the primary endpoint. When you track the patients over time with a Kaplan-Meier curve, again, infliximab in orange and gray placebo, this was not statistically different, although you do see some separation, but not significant. What about the secondary endpoint? And look at the left-hand set of bars. These are the Rutgert scores, and this is something that we're used to seeing. So the gray placebo, orange infliximab, Placebo, we had over 50% of the patients had an endoscopic recurrent, recurrence where orange infliximab, 22%. Again, that 21, 22% recurrence at week 76. And this was significantly different. We also bundled score zero on the left and score three and four on the right. And I should point out, score zero probably means they're totally normal. Three or four is more severe, where a one and a two are very similar. And you can see there was a significantly, I should say, this wasn't an a priori. There were a higher rate of infliximab in the zero compared to placebo, and similarly, higher rate of placebo with more significant endoscopic recurrence. So that's all well and good. That's the early approach. The question is, another study came along in the last year, and this was poker. So the question is, can we wait for recurrence and then treat? So let me just briefly walk you through the study. The primary endpoint of this study was an 18-month endoscopic recurrence of Crohn's after a bowel resection. So that's easy, 18 months endoscopic recurrence. The design randomized patients into two arms, active care versus standard care. Active care means the patients get a six-month colonoscopy. If they have endoscopic recurrence, you do something about it. You change treatment, you add therapy, and then you look again at 18 months or 12 months later for a second time point, and you say, what's the endoscopic recurrence at 18 months? The standard care arm says, we don't want to look at six months. No colonoscopy at six months. Whatever you're put on at time point zero, you're going to stay on for 18 months, and then we'll look. And then they compared those two groups, six-month, 18-month colonoscopy versus those groups that just got an 18-month colonoscopy. All patients went on metronidazole, 400 milligrams twice a day for three months after treatment. Many of the patients didn't tolerate, so they'd had a lower dose or they had to stop. High risk was defined as more than one uh, factor, including smoking, perforating disease, or previous resection. If the patient was high risk and they had not been on treatment before, they were starting on azathioprine or 6-MP. So high risk patients, metronidazole on everybody, azathioprine if they hadn't been on it. If they'd been on azathioprine but could not tolerate it, then they were placed on adalibumab after surgery. Low risk, not smokers, not recurrent surgery, not penetrating disease. Those patients just got metronidazole. And again, both of these groups had a six-month, 18-month colonoscopy active group or just an 18-month colonoscopy. So what were the results? On the left-hand set of bars, recurrence is in kind of the red, blue is remission. Left-hand set of bars is the active care group. Let's look at six months, whatever treatment you're on, if you have disease, let's up your disease and then look again at 18 months. So 49% of the patients who had a six month change treatment then an 18 month colonoscopy had an endoscopic recurrence. This was compared to the standard care group, which is we don't wanna know what it looks like at six months, let's just do the 18 month colonoscopy. 61% of those patients had recurrence. This was statistically different, but only by 18%. The other question, so this is my bars. This was not in the study. This wasn't an a priori endpoint. This wasn't done by the authors. But I wanted to tease out the six-month data on people who are on adalibumab, 
compared to the six-month data on those people on azathioprine from the start. So again, this was not a primary endpoint or secondary endpoint of the study. Thiopurine in the dark purple, 45% of patients six months after surgery had an endoscopic recurrence. And then there's that 21% again. 21% of adalibumab had a six-month recurrence. There's no p-value around this because this was not an a priori endpoint. So this means that waiting on anti-TNF, giving thiopurine, nearly half of the patients had recurrence at six months compared to the 21% in the adalibumab group. So the main question, though, is when do we start anti-TNFs, or for that matter, any treatment? Do we start immediately? Do we wait for endoscopic recurrence? And the other question is, when is it too late? When is that tipping point? Can we predict the tipping point by which it's too late to start treatment? Is it immediate? Is it after histologic? We didn't put up calprotectin, but is it when they start to bump the calprotectin? And then we do know that at some point in these patients, it can be too late. So I'm going to end with two different algorithms on how I think we can reasonably look at postoperative management of Crohn's disease. And I do think we need to take into account the risk. So what are the risk factors? Relative risk factors is less than 30 years of age, short time in the first surgery, having ileocolonic disease. Clear risk factors are active cigarette smoking. I think, this is my opinion, if a patient had been on immunomodulators and it wasn't a last-ditch effort two months before surgery, but went through immunomodulators to progress to surgery, I would include that as a risk in terms of biologic. Penetrating disease and a history of prior resection. So the two approaches, watchful waiting or treat all. So the watchful waiting approach, which is based on poker, would look like this. Low risk versus high risk. Low risk, no risk factors at all, just metronidazole, scope, and then change treatment. High risk depends if they're on azathioprine naive or azathioprine intolerant. So a high-risk azathioprine naive would be metronidazole with 6-MP or azathioprine, then probably look at six months, not at a year, and adjust treatment based on that. A high-risk azathioprine intolerant would be an anti-TNF strategy as done through the POKER study, and then look down the line. So I take a slightly different approach, and this is what I do in my practice, and then I will end here. So I break it down into low, medium, and high risk. So the low risk group, I agree. First surgery after many, many years, 20, 30, 40 years, don't put them on any medicine. And I don't routinely use metronidazole, but we can have a discussion over that. Scope them at six to 12 months, and most of these patients are probably not gonna recur. This is a low risk for recurrence. The moderate risk group, I modify a bit. First surgery within 10 years, a longer inflammatory or stricturing component. So not penetrating disease, smokers, and recurrent surgery. I, this is where I start 6-MP or azathioprine. If your patient tolerates metronidazole, I think it's reasonable. At six months, I scope them. If they have recurrent disease, I step up treatment. And then finally, the high risk, smokers, recurrent surgery, penetrating disease. Those are the patients that I would consider combination treatment and scope at six to 12 months. If you get a fecal calprotectin, reasonable to do it three months as a kind of a post-op baseline and follow maybe at three months later to decide if you scope or wait and watch. So thank you very much for your attention and I appreciate the, uh, the input, thank you.